we have an invited speaker who's come all the way from Portland, Oregon, leaving her two wonderful cats alone for a little bit to keynote our conference. This is Vicky. Vicky is lovely. She has a, she does more stuff than me. Um, she has been a moderator and author for opensource.com, an author for Linux Journal, the vice president of the Open Source Initiative, and is a frequent and popular speaker at free and open source conferences and events. She's the proud winner of the Pearl White Camel Award in 2014, the O'Reilly Open Source Award in 2016, and two opensource.com moderators choice awards in 2018 and 2019. Basically, she's a pillar in the open source community and I wanted to share her with you all. So let's make her feel welcome. There we go. Now I have slides. It really helps when you hit that little play button, doesn't it? Um, so thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I, it's really lovely to actually see you. Last time I spoke, the lights were like right here, and I couldn't see anyone in the audience, and it was kind of discombobulating. I like to connect with my audience. Um, and it's really helpful when you do things like this. Who has heard of or seen this publication? Hands up. Oh, not nearly as many as I expected. Lovely, there's going to be a brilliant education happening here today. So uh, in 2016, Nadia Eggball released this, Roads and Bridges, the Unseen Labor of our, Behind Our Digital Infrastructure. Now, since she released it in 2016, it has become one of the most talked about and most referenced uh, works and publications in free and open source software world. Now, a few of you know about it, uh, but most of you don't. So for those of you who don't know what this is, it is a 142-page report sponsored by the Ford Foundation under a grant that shines this bright light on the woeful state of many critical free and open source software projects and their maintainers. Now, prior to Nadia's report, very few people outside of free and open source software communities knew how few people maintain the software that runs the internet and all the services that run on top of it. After her report, however, a lot of the software industry suddenly were clued in. And they were now aware of the dire situation faced by open source projects, and especially the ones on which their companies were built. And they were shocked. They were shocked and appalled. Oh my gosh, this is terrible. This was, of course, as we probably all know, because they weren't engaged with these open source communities. Had they been paying attention and participating in these communities, they would have known the condition. But they weren't, um, and they were shocked. And they were going to do something about it. By gum and by golly, we're finally going to take action, because now we know that this is a problem. I can take the shoes off. Being technologists, predominantly in the San Francisco Bay Area or in places that you know kind of subscribe to that particular culture, they knew what to do about it. And they started doing what they do best, and that's to build software to make money. So they did that. Since Nadia's report, there's been a flood of new endeavors directed towards getting funding in the hands of open source maintainers. Tons of them. Here's just a few. There's more. Um, but we've got like Tidelift and Open Collective and GitHub sponsors, relatively new. I think they just uh, launched that at GitHub Universe. Um, Linux Foundation Community Bridge just launched in, I think, March, May, not too long ago, 2019. Anyway, there's a lot of these. Um, some of them are nonprofits, but a great deal of them are VC funded. But these, those aren't the only ones. There are more on the way. There are even more that people are talking about. Now, I do a lot of travel, and a lot of people talk to me, and sometimes what they talk to me about is what they're going to do to solve the open source sustainability problem. And it always comes down to building software to get money to get to maintainers. And some of these that haven't launched yet are kind of, it's, I know, it's kind of like someone gave you an excuse to use all the shiny new technology, and you're just going to use it. Why not? Oh my gosh, we can finally find a use for blockchain, can't we? <laughs> so they're doing stuff like that. Um, often when I listen to them, it, it's this kind of, I know, Jurassic Park moment, you know, where they're so preoccupied about figuring out whether they can, they didn't bother to ask whether they should. Right? So there's a lot of that going on. Um, 
But however complex and however you know, cutting edge the software is that comes out for this, at the end of the day, throwing money at the problem is easy for people to do. It's just easy. But when you stop to think about it, it really does make a lot of sense. Because we are, by culture and by experience, we are conditioned to equate money with stability, money with sustainability, money with assistance. We're just conditioned that way. So whenever there's a crisis, the first thing a lot of people do is they reach for their wallets. The very first thing. People want to help. Fundamentally, we really want to help. We see people in pain on the other side of the world, on the other side of the state, and we want to do something to help them. We feel powerless to do anything aside from donate. So contributing money is the easiest way for us to feel as though we are making a difference. And so it's the way we go. We are fundamentally good. We do want to help. Giving money allows us to feel as though we are doing that, even though we may not actually be helping. Because you see, research shows that almost no one follows up on those donations. No one sees whether they were actually needed, how they were used, whether your donation makes a difference. Almost no one does that. Because we give money, and we feel we have exercised our power and we are making a difference because of that. And that's good enough. In many cases, though, throwing money at open source sustainability is a misplaced good intention. And so as I mentioned before, I do travel a lot. Um, while Katie said I live in Portland, Oregon, I do really live in airport lounges. Um, so I travel a lot. And that gives me the opportunity to listen to a lot of people in free and open source software. And a lot of them are maintainers who have recently discovered their projects are starting to get donations through all of those mechanisms that came in before. Came as a big surprise to them. Oh my gosh, I have money. Yay, it's like that old AOL, you got mail, except with money. Um, but they don't know what to do with it. It just sort of arrived. They don't know what to do with it. They don't know where to keep it. And Really shockingly and disturbingly, until we start having conversations, they don't realize that there are tax implications for this money that shows up on their doorstep. And suddenly you see them go white as a sheet. They're like, oh, shit, this just got complicated. Well, honey, I'm sorry, it was complicated before that. It's just you realize it at the moment. That's what happens. So no one asked them whether they wanted the money. People just assume that they are powerless to help free and open source software sustainability. And they're conditioned to believe money good. That's what we are conditioned to believe in our, in our culture. So people do keep focusing on the funding side of open source sustainability, equating money to sustainability. This is despite the report's very, very clear focus on a multifaceted approach to infrastructure maintenance. It's obvious these people didn't really read the full report, or if they did, they didn't understand it. So we have been conditioned to equate sustainable to funding, and that's where we focus our time. But as so often is the case, not only are we conditioned to believe money is sustainability, but we're reinventing the wheel. We in software keep doing this. Rather than investigating how other industries may have tackled similar or related problems, we go out and we reinvent the wheel because our problems are special. No one else has ever experienced anything like open source sustainability before. This, this is really special and only we can resolve it. So if we really want to address the problems of open source sustainability, if we even let alone want to define what open source sustainability is, Maybe we should look around. Maybe we should do the thing that we do best, which is look at what other people have done and then build upon it. Where we should look, I think, to start is a, an unexpected source. Some, it's unexpected for us in open source software. And that's the corporate world. We should look at corporate sustainability planning, starting with this publication. It's titled Our Common Future. The World Commission on Environment and Development, and you know, feel free to go find it in that way, but how are you going to see it referred to elsewhere, is the Brundtland Report. 
This is how it's popularly known. So back in the 80s, whole bunch of companies picked their heads up from their ledgers and they looked around and they're like, oh wow, things could go really bad with our planet. Things could get terrible and if people could die and then who would we sell to? <laughs> it would be terrible. My business would fail and die because I would have no more customers. Um, so they got together and they published this report. Actually, it was published by the United Nations in 1987 after several years of international study and discussions about environment and development. And the organizations that were having these discussions were huge corporations and governments and scientists, you know, all the people who should be getting in a room to have these conversations. But it was driven by the corporations. Now, the report discovered that it is absolutely impossible to talk about growing an economy without also talking about growing and sustaining the environment. Now keep in mind, these are corporations. These are groups that really, really want to make it all about the money because that's what they're there for, is to run a business and to make money. They tried so hard to make sustainability about the money and they couldn't do it. So this report focuses on environmental conservation and corporate responsibilities for human sustainability and how these things are absolutely vital for corporate success. And it starts with something that I haven't really seen most of these open source sustainability things start with, and that's a definition of what sustainability is. So they took it from the report's audience perspective, which are, were, of course, mostly corporations, but also governments. Um, it is, however, general enough and applicable enough that I think we should use it for open source, or at least as a basis. Now, it defines sustainability as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability for future generations to meet their own needs. It re recognizes the balance between economy and ecology between money and ecosystems. There is, it has to be a balance there. Now, it's important to note that ecosystem isn't simply something like, I don't know, trees and water and the cute little birds and even the bin chickens and stuff like that. Um, so we, it's important to remember what ecosystem actually means. And so I, after looking up, up a lot of definitions, um, the internet's favorite snarky dictionary had the best one. Um, so Merriam-Webster here defines ecosystem as the complex of a community of organisms and its environment functioning as an ecological unit, functioning as a single unit. There are a lot of elements to ecosystems. Some of them are living, some of them are not, but all of them play vital roles. We are surrounded by them. <clears throat> we can't escape ecosystems. Even if we die, we become a part of the ecosystem, just we take on a different role. So we were surrounded by them, and each ecosystem is itself a part and an element of a larger ecosystem. It's ecosystems all the way down. For example, if you go out that door and you look out the windows, you see beautiful Darling Harbor, really gorgeous view out there. Darling Harbor is its own ecosystem, but it's a part of the larger ecosystem of the Australian coast, which is a part of the larger ecosystem of the Pacific Ocean, which is a part of the larger ecosystem of, you know, it just keeps going, but there are smaller ecosystems, sub-ecosystems. Look around you. Python is its own ecosystem, a vibrant, living, growing, breathing ecosystem, but it's a very important part of the larger free and open source software ecosystem. Now, because there are so many moving parts in an ecosystem, and they're so tightly intertwined here, you can't affect change on one part without also paying attention to how it affects all the others. And this is what the authors of the Brundtland Report found in their 900 days of study and research into this. It found that while the ecosystem is complex, there are three elements. You know, there's lots of things you could focus on, but three that are absolutely fundamental for meeting the goal of sustainable corporate development. You have poverty reduction, wealth redistribution, and gender equality. This was published in 1987. 
not only did it find that there are these three elements, but it found that they are completely interseparable. They are, and I quote, interlocking crises, each one a component of the larger crisis. And a company looking to work on corporate sustainability can't simply choose to focus on one of them, say gender equality, and hope that that is going to lead to corporate sustainability. It might improve gender equality, yes, but it doesn't lead to a, making the world a more sustainable place from a corporate point of view. Each one of the elements has to be addressed simultaneously if there is to be any effect at all. This is all or nothing. That's what they found in this 900 days of dramatic research across the entire world. So the Brundtland Report has led to the corporate sustainability movement. Um, I'm not going to go into that much more, but if you're interested in it, I do recommend you start with this article here from the MIT Sloan School of Business. They have a lot of excellent articles on corporate sustainability, but this one's a good starting point. Pausing for a refresher. So as I mentioned before, there are many elements to corporate sustainability. They all have to be addressed simultaneously. Now, you can look at these. Um, natural resource usage, like you know, recycling, going to wind power, stuff like that. Um, diversity and inclusion. Um, you know, all these things, some sort of funding is implied here because you're not going to have fair treatment of employees if you're not spending more money to pay them all equally. There is funding implied there. But none of these elements involve simply throwing money at the problem. Not a single one. So as you can probably imagine, coming up with and implementing a corporate sustainability plan, something that covers all of those elements, it can take a lot of effort and it can take a lot of time because sustainability is not simple and it's not easy. So why would a company do that? You know, is it purely because of altruism, because taking care of our world and its inhabitants is the right thing to do? Well, for some companies, yes, it is. I work for Juniper Networks, and we do have a corporate sustainability plan, and I am very happy that for us, it is a part of our culture. Deep down, we honestly do believe in having a more sustainable world and healthier environment and healthier people in it. It's one of the many reasons why I love working for Juniper Networks. You know, but... It doesn't hurt that studies repeatedly show that a well-executed corporate sustainability plan is oh so fine for your bottom line, as well as for the planet and its inhabitants. There are so many benefits to companies to having a well-executed corporate sustainability plan. The ones I list here are just a few, right? You do have a more reliable supply chain which goes back to what Oren was saying yesterday about companies hating risk. If you have a reliable supply chain, you get rid of that risk. They love that. And if they can save the earth while they're doing that as well, all the better. You know, you have happier people, you have better communication, you have better innovation, you know. There's just so much that's great. You also get better investments. People are more likely to invest in your company if you can show you have a successful corporate sustainability plan. Why? Well, why would I put money in something that's not already looking for the long term? Why would I invest in something if I don't know the company's hoping to be around in 5, 10, 20 years so I can get a return on my investment? So that's something that is really powerful for companies if they have a good corporate sustainability plan. Now, I've been sitting up here beating the corporate sustainability plan drum. Um, it's probably the first time most of you have ever heard of it, so that's great. I'm glad you all know about it. Um, but why bother? Why am I doing this? I mean, I didn't exactly bury the lead. I was pretty upfront about the fact that we should be paying attention to what other groups have done in the past, rather than reinventing the wheel and approaching the subject of sustainability from scratch, which is what we have been doing. Free and open source software needs to follow the open source way and build on the contributions from those who came before us. Those contributions don't have to come from software. We are suffering from our own massive case of not invented here syndrome. In this case, we should be looking towards things like corporate sustainability planning to form some sort of template and guidelines for how we can start to approach this because they've already done a lot of work. We shouldn't have to do it all over again.
So firstly, with corporate, as with corporate sustainability planning, our focus should be on so much more than simply money. And let me be perfectly crystal clear here, because I have had these conversations and then people come back afterwards and misquote me. I am all for paying maintainers. I am not saying don't pay your maintainers. If your maintainer is creating something that is valuable to you and your company, support them, right? Pay them if that's what makes sense. But paying them alone is not going to provide the support that free and open source software needs for its longevity and its continued success. Because it is complicated. It's not simply a matter of throwing money at this problem. Just as with corporate sustainability planning, there are these interlocking crises, and each one is a component of the larger crisis of open source sustainability. You can't simply focus on one, say funding because it's easy for you, and then call it done. Now, here are three elements of open source sustainability planning. You have contributing back human and environmental diversity and community safety, and each one of these is intertwined and inseparable and must be addressed simultaneously, because each one needs to be addressed by all people and all organizations that want to work towards a more sustainable, open source world. So since the very beginning of free and open source software, we have had people and organizations who use free and open source but don't contribute back. We call them free riders. You've probably heard it before. And often we're, we use this highly derogatorily. Is that a word? It is now. Um, so we, we use it in a very negative way. Oh, they're a free rider, and we dismiss them. They're no good. Well, these organizations may not understand that what they are doing with this is degrading the longevity and success of the free and open source software that they rely on. They may not understand. And what I find is that they probably don't even know what contributing back means. Because we never talk about it. And we should. Because contributing back can take many forms, and it doesn't necessarily have to be paying for things. Now, a few weeks ago, I was in uh, Portland, Oregon, my beautiful home. You should visit sometime. Um, it's a lot like uh, Hobart, but without as good a coffee. <laughs> so um, I was in beautiful Portland, Oregon for O'Reilly Open Source Convention, and I was sitting around the table with a bunch of people having a chat, and the topic of open source sustainability comes up, as it for so often does these days, or at least in the circles I run in. And I was at the table with Tiffany Forrest of the Drupal Association. And she blew everyone's mind when she just sort of walked up and mic dropped this line. Because it so perfectly covers what we should be talking about for contributing back. There are three things that organizations and individuals can do. We can contribute our time, our talent, our treasure. I mean, it just sums everything up so perfectly, and we need to be having our conversation around that. You can contribute your time by doing things like volunteering at events like this or organizing events like this. Most of you have no concept of how much time is invested in organizing an event like this and what a massive gift it is to the Python community. You can contribute your talent you can do things like, I don't know, run security audits, if that's something you know. Or you can redesign a project to have improved accessibility. You can do that. That is another way. Or yes, you can contribute your treasure and you can just donate money. But it's important to recognize that each one of these things, time, talent, treasure, each one is an equally valid method of supporting a project. Equally valid. One is not better than another. There are plenty of people out here, maybe even in this audience, who can't afford the treasure. But they might be able to give a little time. And frankly, that's far more valuable. Because while it might not feel that way when you're struggling to make rent or to get food on the table, you can make more money. But you can never, never make more time. Once it's spent, it's gone. So if you're donating your time to an organization, that is such, really, that's the real treasure. It's donating your time. So 
we have to remember and we have to respect that each person has their own personal constraints. And we have to respect that and work with them so they can feel the power that they actually have to be a part of open source sustainability. Because while money is sometimes welcomed by projects, service and administrative assistance is often needed more. And once I get another drink, I have a story. Now in my professional life, I have worked with maintainers of vital pieces of free and open source software infrastructure. These people worked on that, these vital pieces of infrastructure full time, 100% of their time for the company that employed us. They were paid by the company to do this 100% of their time. And you know, to make it back about money, I know exactly how much these people were making because I was their direct manager. And so I was responsible for their bonuses and their salaries. And I'm here to tell you, no amount of money, not a red cent, could make up for the fact that these people were still working 60 to 80 hours a week on these projects and had been for years, even before they joined the company. They didn't need more money. I would gladly have given them more and they would have accepted it because they're not fools. <laughs> Right, I would have given them more money, but that's not what they needed. They needed time with their family, with their loved ones to relax. They needed to get rid of the cycle of burnout. And that's what we were working to get them. We were getting them help. We were reducing that bus factor so that if one of them got hit by a bus, the entire project wouldn't come crashing down. We were working on that. In some cases, that sort of thing can involve an additional outlay in cash to hire more help or to get more people on board for that. Yeah, it can, but that's not the goal. The goal wasn't about the treasure. The goal was about the time and the talent. And that's what we were working on. Money wouldn't have helped. So the next element in ensuring sustainable open source ecosystem is human and environmental diversity. Contributing back helps so much in this way because you get more people into the community. So for the sake of free and open source software, getting more and varied people involved not only provides more resources, but it also makes for more innovation and more stability. You get rid of that bus factor where one person gets hit by a bus and everything comes crashing down. Um, a growing body of research consistently shows that diverse teams outperform teams without diversity on them. Like, wow, amazingly outperform, not just sort of moderately. They blow them away. It's incredible. Because diverse perspectives not only encourage, but enforce better communication. Diverse perspectives big, bring in ideas that you didn't see before. Diverse perspectives do things like, well, you say we've always done it this way, but why? and it leads to a better overall product, better communities, it's great. But diversity doesn't simply mean what you all probably thought of when I said diversity, which is gender, race, perhaps experiential background. There's so much more. For instance, there's geographic and language diversity. Free and open source software is used all over the world. Here we are in Australia, I'm not from Australia. And yet here we are, all doing free and open source software together. But the majority of the documentation, it's available only in one language, and that's the language of the primary maintainer. And let's all be perfectly honest here, that language is almost always English. Participation and contribution by people from other countries can help to open the door to millions of new contributors that can make every free and open source software project so much more sustainable because there are more people there to help out. So if you're able to get one person into your project who speaks Mandarin or Urdu or Spanish or German or anything aside from the primary language, just one, you know what you've just done? You've now made your project so much more appealing to anyone else who speaks Mandarin or Urdu or Spanish, or German, or whatever. It just takes one for people to look at your project and go, oh, there's someone there who understands me. And suddenly, you've just thrown the doors open to China, and India, and Latin America, 
You know, it, there's so much power that can come from just getting one person on who understands another language. But there's more to diversity than simply the people. Talking is a thirsty thing. Yeah. We should be lucky it's not coffee. Um, so I, uh, I do free and open source software business strategy. So I help companies be successful through free and open source software. And by successful, yes, it means getting more money, but it means doing it in a way that's good for the community as well as the company. Super easy to do, or at least to talk about, difficult to implement. So I used to do this on a freelance basis. I now am exclusive to, um, to Juniper Networks. We are in a monogamous relationship, and I'm happy about that. Um, so in my, in my discussions with companies, I, uh, you learn this, this obvious thing, and it, which is obvious in retrospect, but if you don't talk to companies about it, it might not be obvious. And that's that a lot of companies choose free and open source software solutions because it avoids vendor lock-in. Now, what this means is that you could have a vendor providing something for you, and they could fuck off. They could disappear. <laughs> they could get acquired. You know, all sorts of things could happen, and suddenly this piece of software that you rely on, you're screwed. It goes away, a la Google Reader. <laughs> you know, a single vendor becomes a single point of failure, and to call back to Aaron's keynote yesterday, that is risk, and companies don't like risk. The same is true for open source projects. Consolidation under single services, under single service providers, under single foundations. This creates a monoculture within open source. And it doesn't matter how good a single service, a single service provider, or a single foundation is. It does not matter. Because those are single points of failure. And be they human or ecological or technological, research and reality consistently show that monocultures are massive risks. Single point of failure is always horrible for sustainability, whether it's open source or anything else. And as an open source participant, engaged in contributing back rather than simply an open source onlooker, you have the power and the ability to protect against the creation and dominance of monocultures within open source software. But it's not possible to build that, that diverse contributor base for projects where people don't feel safe, when people won't contribute back, if they're afraid that there will be belittling comments. Personally directed criticism, sexualized language, imagery, behavior, bigoted, racist, sexist, hateful language unwelcome simulated or actual physical contact, all of these things, actions like these undermine the trust required to create a psychologically safe environment. And that environment is necessary. Research consistently shows, I'm gonna go keep going back to the data folks because this isn't just feeling. We got science on our side, that this stuff is necessary for a thriving team and for especially for a thriving free and open source software project where the people you're interacting with, you may never meet in real life. So these actions scare people away from contributing, or if they're there already, it will force them to leave. As an open source participant, you have the power. You are in a position to witness unprofessional and unwelcoming behavior and take action to squash it. Except it doesn't have to be dramatic like that. You don't have to squash anything. One of the greatest things I saw yesterday and in the opening statements was Katie saying that if you see something you don't like, all you have to do is say, we don't do that here. And that is such a powerful statement that helps to set up community norms and build a safe and sustainable environment. Because without community safety, an open source project is unlikely to have a long and successful life, but I don't have to tell that to a room full of Pythoners, do I? I don't, because years ago, Python did the incredibly difficult work of introspection at looking at itself and saying, do we want to be this way? Is this the community we want to be? Is this the language we want to be? And it said, nah, I don't think so. And it took action. And look at what's happened since. I mean, would you look at this? I mean, sure, there are other reasons why you get this up and to the right 
which, you know, if you're in the Bay Area, that's what you want, up and to the right. right? Um, so uh, there's lots of reasons why this could have happened, but I can almost guarantee, and this is one point where I can't go back on data because there's no way to tell for sure, but I can guarantee Python would not be as successful today if it didn't value community safety in the way it does and make it a fundamental part of its culture. That's amazing. It has done wonderful things for your community. And you are all, by the way, Python is something other communities look to for how to do it right. So one way you can help to ensure community safety is by restricting your contributions only to open source projects that both have and enforce a code of conduct. Um, the contributor covenant is listed here. It's used by lots of projects. It's a very good example of a code of conduct. It's also under Creative Commons license, so feel free to fork it, use it, live it, love it, the way that we do in open source. Um, however, having a code of conduct is one thing, but empathetically enforcing it is another. Code of, codes of conduct are relatively new to a lot of projects. They're still trying to figure out how to do this. Um, so when you're looking at a project, um, you can tick that little box. Yes, they have a code of conduct, but also do a little research to see whether they're at least trying to do the enforcement in an empathetic way. So these are the three elements of open source sustainability. And in light of all of this, what is now the real cost of open source sustainability? What is your personal open source sustainability plan going to look like? I don't know. I am not going to dictate it to you. There is likely a very, very short list of people who get to tell you how to spell it, spend your time, talent, and treasure. I ain't on that list. I am not there. What I can tell you is that there is no one right way to do this. You all have your own personal needs, your own personal constraints. You have different projects that are strategically or emotionally important to you, and each of those projects have their own needs. So I'm not going to tell you specifically what you should be doing because I can't. I am not on that very short list of folks who can tell you how to use your time, talent, and treasure. But I am going to say do something and maybe start here. Um, find out what projects are important to you, see what they need, and then do it. Sounds simple, right? But it's not. Nothing is ever that simple. Each one of these steps is very involved. And there is no one-size-fits-all solution. So you need to be like Python and do the very hard work of the introspection to figure out what's right for you. Now, when you are doing this, um, you can't support every single project. It would be nice. It would be wonderful to go out there. But it's not possible. It's not maintainable. If you're making an open source sustainability plan, that plan itself should be sustainable. And I'm sorry, honey, y'all don't scale. <laughs> So you got to figure out what's important. Take some time. If I were talking to a company, I'd say, what is your open source supply chain? Look at your open source supply chain, your own personal ones. What's important to you for what you do? And then look at the links of that chain. Which one of those links are load bearing? And if they were to break, everything would come crashing down. Those are the important ones, right? It could be, again, strategically. It could be emotionally. It doesn't matter. What's important to you is important. But once you've identified those, then if you're not already in the community, join it and find out what they need for longevity and sustainability. It could be testing. It could be programming. It could be documentation, administration, project management, design, infrastructure, security, or yes, it could simply be throwing money at the problem. That is a valid option. The key here is you cannot assume that you know better than the project does. You just can't. So collaborate with them. Don't simply force some sort of support on them because it's easy for you and makes you feel better. And once you've done that, now you have to do the hard work of actually taking action. Implement your plan. As with a corporate sustainability plan, open source sustainability plan is something that takes time, patience, and commitment. You, it can't be rushed. It can't. This is sustainability. You're taking the long view. It also means you can't simply copy the plan of someone else. But good news, folks, it doesn't take much to start. Baby steps are still steps. Small actions are better than no actions at all. So you look at your constraints and you work within them, and that means you can only spend an hour a week to give mentoring to new people who want to come in. That's an hour a week that that project didn't have before, and that is super valuable. If you put in that time, though, 
if you take the effort, if you do that introspection, if you do the research, if you don't simply throw money at the problem, you find it's worth it. Not only will you have helped contribute to the sustainability of free and open source software projects that you care very deeply about, but you probably now have joined a community that is going to be so deeply grateful to you for it. So I am Bian Brasur, Director of Open Source Strategy at Juniper Networks. I'm also the author of this, the first and only book about how to contribute to open source software projects. You can find me up here at Twitter. Um, you can find these slides right now at Internet Archive at that other URL, and the book at the URL at the bottom. I want to express the most heartfelt thanks to the PyCon Australia team for having me here. I am incredibly grateful, but even more than that, I'm grateful to all of you for being here and for being a part of the open source community. Thank you.